So this is Chopping It Up, and we are talking to JJ um, about social justice. Um, so welcome. Happy to have you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be talking to you guys today, particularly around uh, social justice. Well, Jason, how are you, cool. man? Yeah. Good. Good Sunday. It's cold in New York. Is JJ, it? where are you? I'm in Chicago. Yeah. Mm. So, so as, yeah. how's it? And it's a little, yeah, no good. I, you know, like uh, weather wise, it's a little chilly too, which is kind of strange, but it's going to, you know, be nice. Um, just a couple of dips. And then just in general, great. You know, I've lived here for 15 years, I think. I'm going on 15, 16 years. Yeah, I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa. Lived in Spain for a couple of years. Lived in Ecuador for a year. And then I've been here for 15. So this is definitely where I've spent the longest time. Is that where, uh, is, is that where Mara is? Yeah. In Chicago? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. We've worked a bit together on, um, you know, f um, for in one solution and stuff. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's awesome. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I, I would love to know what it's like living in Spain and, you know, some of those other countries from being from Texas. Yeah. Well, first of all, my dad lives in Texas. I don't know if you remember that. So like, yeah, my dad lives in Dallas. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, most of the year. And then he he's in Minnesota. But anyway, yeah. So, um, you know, when I was, ever since I can remember, um, I've been fascinated by other places, other cultures, other languages, people. I just even remember my earliest mem memory of like anything Spanish or Spain or Latin America related was, was tiny. I don't remember how old I was. And I, I went to the library with my mom, the public library. And I remember pulling out this book that said Spain on the top. And it was like a picture of a woman, you know, like in a flamenco dress. And I was like, Ooh, and I just remember like pouring over that book anyway. And then throughout, you know, just always was so interested in culture, people, language, got really interested. And then in high school, my, um, you know, I was taking Spanish class and all of that. And my um, high school teachers offered a trip to Spain and I was like going, you know, so it was, um, it was great. I went there. And then when I was, I remember thinking when I was in Madrid, like, oh, I'm coming back here. Like, this is, this is, I'm not done with this yet, you know? And then the same thing. And then when I was in college, I studied abroad in, um, Sevilla, which is in the South of Spain. And I just remember, um, you know, so, to sort of bring this into 3P language and then about like the language of Spanish. I remember when I went to study abroad in Spain, thinking like, oh, I, I've been studying Spanish so long. I, I got this language down. I got, you know, I got this thing down. And then I got there and I was like, what? <laughs> I could understand. I'm like, wait, wait, what? I was living with the family and I just was like, um, hmm. And I, uh, I, but I remember every day it was like went from intellectual into the bones, you know, like every day I would get more and more language acquisition and it would get more and more where I didn't have to think about it anymore. And I just remember after, you know, after a few months having a dream in Spanish and being like, whoa, like that was so cool, you know? So I, I relate a lot of like, um, this is a little bit off topic, but I relate a lot of like what we're studying about with the mind and, you know, when it's intellectual versus sort of wisdom and getting in your bones and you just know it to how I learned Spanish, because it was that's just to me an analogy that makes sense. But anyway, and then the same thing after my semester, I was like, no, I'm not done. Like, I, I need to I need to come back here. So after college, I um, I figured out a way to get back and I worked as a camp counselor in a military base in southern Spain um, for the summer. And I, that was my free plane ticket and my, you know, uh, job. And then at the end of the summer, instead of going home, I just went up to Madrid and, and, and looked for a job teaching English and found one. And then I was in Madrid for a year and a half and it was the best, for sure, the best time of my life. And not just because I was, it's not just because it was Spain. I mean, I loved it. I clearly love the country and everything it has to offer, but it was, it was like, um, 
it was like I was living sort of day by day, you know, like I was getting by and I didn't really worry about. It. So like, again, bringing it back to 3P stuff, I just kind of let myself be navigated to find a job, to find friends, to whatever. So it was terrific. And I taught English to um, both preschoolers and adults. And, um, and it was really fun. You know, they just, the adults just wanted to practice their English. And, and so we just, it was really fun, you know? Um, and Madrid is kind of like a city to me that doesn't sleep. It's kind of like the, you know, like the New York <laughs> doesn't sleep. I mean, it is so exciting. And particularly for someone who was 20, I was, you know, 21 to 25 or, you know, in those years or whatever. Yeah. It was amazing. It was amazing. And I feel like I learned so much both about the country and, um, and about, and, and then like looking at different systems, there, going, Oh, weird. Like, Oh, not weird, but like, Oh, that's how they do it here. And like having the, and being able to compare to what I, what the sort of conditioning that I grew up with, whether it was family schools, um, you know, uh, you know, social rules, um, the schedule of the day. And so it was really cool to be able to sort of have that internal experience of seeing a different perspective and seeing a different, oh, interesting. You know, this is when they eat lunch or this is how they eat lunch. Or this is what they believe about nutrition or whatever it was, you know. Yeah. So I know this about you and we've not said this, but you are in the education system here in America. Mm -hmm. And I'm really wondering how that time over there has affected what you've seen here. Um, well, I feel like, I feel like the, what, I feel like a few things. I feel like how it's affected my, um, um, how I teach here is that what I really want for my students is to open their minds and open their worlds to different possibilities and to different ways of doing things and different people to meet and different perspectives and different stories, period. Like that's my biggest goal as a teacher. And I think because I had such a great experience as a young person having my mind like blown wide open, going, oh my God, right? I think that's mostly what I want for my students. I don't really care how well they conjugate verbs, you know, like they don't really like that either, <laughs> but you know, so it's like, again, I just want them to, to go, Oh, how interesting. Like through culture, through people's stories, through movies, um, talking to people now with all this technology, if they can have a pen pal in a different country, we're working on that. Some of that's kind of tricky. Um, I just want them to really open their minds and, and hearts, really. That's yeah. cool. And, and what what I kind of got got from your first part of the story, you know, where you talked about the dress and things like that, where you see the different cultures. And to me, it's it's like, you know, we already think we know. Oh, like, I get it. I get how the world works. You know, I already know things. So going to another country and just seeing how they do things there, like almost unlocks different parts of the mind, you know, like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think it could be done this way. Yeah. In the same way with the language, a different language. It's like, there's a whole nother way of communicating. Yeah. And, and, and that's fascinating. Yeah, it, totally. A whole other way of communicating. And then what it's been so cool about what, you know, in our program, when they say beyond language, I'm like, oh, wow. So it, it is like, you know, it's, it's like you've got different languages, but then it's like beyond the words period. And really, right. You know, but yeah, and and you know, I've done a lot of um, to sort of sideways a little bit. I've done a lot of travel, and you know, because I have summers off too, and I've just been so lucky to to be able to travel, to have the time uh, in my summers, and and then because I teach Spanish, to to travel to other um, countries as well and study in other countries. So um, I've been to a lot of places in Latin America, and 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 I. Similarly to my experience in Spain as like a 20, you know, something year old, when I, I, I've been to Colombia a number of, uh, a, a number of times, um, later on in my life, like in my thirties. And, um, that experience also completely blew me away, completely blew me away because if we wanted to segment into social justice and resilience, um, I went first in 2000, 
four to Colombia. I was actually living in Ecuador and a friend of mine who was Colombian and living in Ecuador, so she invited me to her house in, in Bogota. So we flew from Quito to Bogota and it was a really fascinating, you know, sort of five days in, in Bogota. And, but I remember thinking that there was so much more to the country that I wasn't seeing because she sort of lives in like this northern, the northern part of Bogota. Um, it comes from a pretty wealthy family. And I just remember thinking, there's so much more to this country that I'm not seeing. And fast forward, not even a year later, and I went on this human rights delegation to, um, to Colombia in the summer of 2005. And it blew me away like I can't even describe, but well, I can describe it. But um, I think what, what gave me so much um, sort of hope and faith and like a knowing that we really are resilient was seeing what I saw in this human rights delegation in Colombia. I saw so much injustice. Oh my God, so much injustice in that country. So much so much disparity between um, economic classes, um, so much blatant, um, you know, racism and and classism, and um, it just, I mean, you know, and so much um, impunity for literally murder. I was so sort of, I was blown away by that. And I was like, that's not fair. And then on the other side, when we went to, we were in Bogota in the city of Medellin, and then we also went into a village in the in a, um, an area of Colombia called Choco. And in those three areas, we met with different um, nonprofits and and um, and it, uh, people that were basically working within the system to improve people's lives. And so we met with, for example, in the city of Medellin. I remember we met with um, a group of the. Um, it was called a. Um, not remembering the name, but it was basically families of the disappeared. So it was people who had had family members who were disappeared, or in other words, killed by um, most likely paramilitary groups um, for standing up for human rights. So things have, this is 2005, and things have really changed in Colombia, but, but there's still um, many human rights issues. But um, but in 2005, there was there was so much paramilitary control of of land, there was both leftist and right wing um, illegal armed groups, guerrilla groups, and, and paramilitary groups. And if you were Colombian standing out for human rights, you had to be really careful because these groups obviously don't want people to be speaking, um, you know, uh, for human rights and exposing the truth of what's been going on. So, and if that happened, they would, you know, you could be disappeared. You could be put on a, a like a list and be disappeared. And there were, yeah, there was like a group of people then who formed this group to say, okay, we are the, you know, the family of the disappeared and we want to help people. And it was just meeting group and group, you know, groups of, uh, over and over like that, that blew me away because they were helping kids in their neighborhood. They were teaching skills to 14 and 15 year old kids. They were um, supporting each other. We went to this village in Choco, this area of Colombia that, and it's rural, rural, rural in the in the, in the um, jungle. And this this group of people had basically their land had been taken away from there by force by paramilitary groups, and they killed eighty members of their of their community. Wow. And mm -hmm, in I think two thousand one, I want to say, and because their land was so valuable, you know, it was so valuable, and and there was all these, um, uh, basically a fight for their land. So they were um, forced off their land. They went to live basically in the equivalent of a high school gym in the closest town, which was like two hours away by boat. Um, and their stories were unbelievable because they're refugees, you know, in their own country. And they got together and they got this, they solicited help with both Colombian human rights lawyers and then um, I believe it was Peace Brigades International, which is based out of London. And they basically collaborated. The amazing thing is they got their land back. Like that just doesn't happen in Colombia. Like it just doesn't happen. If you're if you're like kicked off your land, like that's it. You end up in, you know, the shanty towns of a city. They got their land back. And then there was still paramilitary presence, but 
they, as a way to sort of keep them distanced, um, they would have these uh, programs called accompaniment programs, where basically they would have a visitor from the US, from the Canada, from a European um, NGOs that would sort of just be there with them. And they could, and because the, the paramilitaries didn't want that kind of, um, yeah. that kind of, you know. They didn't want that heat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand. It was, it was like amazing because they had their own organic farming. They had built their own school. They had, you know, you you go into their um, community and it has like a declaration of what they believe in. You know, we don't believe in any armed forces, et cetera, et cetera. They were astonishing to me because, again, that's where I really, really saw clearly, oh, my God, people are resilient. Like people, that is what we're made of. Like we are made of resilience and creativity and and it, it just blew me away. Like you know, so, I mean, I learned way more, you know, from them that, I mean, they had, you know, they, they basically, I just was there to accompany and to learn and to show solidarity. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I've kind of taken a bunch of different, <laughs> I got that's, zigzagged that's, around there. <laughs> that sounds insane. Like, yeah. insane like i didn't know that about you that you had spent that time over there and that you were able to go into some of these areas that i've never been in i know jason i don't know maybe you've been over there before i don't know but um it's just really interesting because i was listening to a conversation with someone and they were telling me about how we don't understand poverty here in america like mm -hmm. other countries understand poverty mm -hmm. Like poverty here in America is like really like very like not well off, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and so it's very interesting that you're in Chicago and working in the school system and you've been through these experiences where you've seen how like these um, people just band together. And I don't know if y'all remember Michael telling a story. It might not have been Michael, but somebody telling a, a story about there is a place where the people, the women in the city or that town said, hey, we don't want drug dealers in our town anymore. Mm -hmm. So they went and they like talked to the police and they were like, hey, if you don't make us testify, we'll make sure you can get all the drug dealers and all that stuff out of the town. And from my understanding, they are still in a drug free town like they don't there's not that in their area. Yeah. What are you seeing in regards to that? Like that resilience, that ability to come together when it comes to the social justice um, topic here in America right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, so. I think that I think that's kind of what people do. I think it's kind of human nature to that. Uh, that creativity comes pouring out, particularly this is my opinion, but particularly when there is a crisis situation, you know, um, and maybe, and, and, I, and I don't know what happens. I think you just sort of like are so in it that you, you're maybe your thinking drops and you come up with amazing solutions. I mean, it's, it's, I feel like I've seen it over and over and over again. And um, so a couple things here, I think it's, I, I've never seen, and I'd love to know, you know, what you guys think, but here right now in this moment, I, I, I've never seen such solidarity and I hope it stays. I hope it's sustained, but it's like in a moment in like, for whatever reason, in like such a short amount of time, it's like, boom, and then you've got this like domino and ripple effect of like businesses, you know, supporting um, Black Lives Matter, power structures within the businesses changing, um, Netflix saying, you know, here's some documentaries to educate yourself. People get going, reading books saying, I want to educate and see what's going on. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. I think it's amazing. I'm hopeful that it sustains and, 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 you know, policies change and things. I'm really hopeful. I think it's amazing what humans can do, you know, together, particularly um, to make change, <laughs> you know, yeah, and I think it's like getting that getting it's almost like getting the wave started at a sporting event, right? That's the hardest part. Once once there's some activity, it's in people's awareness, like they want to be part of it. So just getting the momentum going. So if we can keep the momentum going. 
you know, that would That's be so cool. huge. What, um, yeah. um, oh, go ahead, JJ. No, I was just going to say that's a cool analogy. No, go ahead. No, that's a, I love that analogy. And I've, Jason, you always come in with the heat with those analogies, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I was thinking about in that moment was just how, like, a lot of us did not think that the younger generation had them in it, had this in them to do. If that makes any sense. And what I mean is not just to go out in the streets and protest, because that is a thing. But like you're saying, like Rogue Fitness was a big sponsor of CrossFit, the CrossFit Games. And mm -hmm. the CrossFit CEO said some crazy stuff. And well, actually, he said instead of COVID-19, he called it um, anyway, something stupid. And Rogue, every all the major sponsors were like, we're not we're not calling it CrossFit anymore. Like a lot of the CrossFit affiliates right now are saying we're not going to be CrossFit affiliates unless something changes at the top. And I've never seen it happen where like, I've got so many people like on my social media that would rant, would not even be saying this kind of stuff. This yeah. black swan yoga, like so many different places are just like, Hey, this may have been a thing in the past. And now that you're showing us that this is a thing, let's go ahead and end this. Yeah. But what I'm loving the most is a lot of people trying to fight for not just black rights, but all rights, right? So if we really like scale it back and we say, hey, we are all the same. We are all people. We are all humans. And some aliens came from outer space and said, okay, it's us versus y'all. Like it, it won't be, hey, you're black, I'm white, you're, you're gay, you're lesbian. It'd be like, we all need to get together yeah. to go fight them. And so what I would yeah. really hope from not just our conversation, but the conversations that are they're really sparking up is that we look at this as let's not have to come back to the table for human rights ever again. And I was wondering if y'all saw anything in that, because that's I mean, this is something new for me, something fresh for me. Well, just one thing I'll say about that is like. You know, when it is the aliens against us, which most likely in, in my estimation, it would be us against the aliens. We probably would start the stuff. <laughs> the aliens, they probably didn't want to fight, you know, <laughs> where we thought it was necessary. But just seeing it as separate selves, right? At that point, it's us against them, but it's us as a whole. And, and we don't see that right now because we don't see the other us. So right now we have to, you know, a lot of people see it as, okay, there's us, there's them, and then there's them, and then there's them. But if we could see it as it's just all us, right? That the, 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 the connection between all of us, the, that we're all made of the same stuff, the oneness of it, you know, I think a lot of that would uh, solve a few things. Yeah, I, I think that um, as a teacher, I would love to see and I'm sort of in this, um, what Jason's talking about, that education of, of um, how, you know, the, the, what, what is thought, what is feeling, getting more into sort of understanding that, the, the resilience, really seeing the inside out nature, because I think that would alleviate so many problems out in the world. So, because I just do, to your point, and I think also if you, if you have, if you think, um, which I think the majority culture does, that we live in an outside world, or excuse me, outside in world, and I get, I get it, um, then then we are going to create sort of um, groups and us and divisiveness and us versus them, and so I think yes, stripping it back. I mean, I think that that's that piece of a conversation is what is often missing in social change, in social justice, in any kind of change is, is the, the, in experiencing the oneness. And so it's like, to me, I see it as like, there's externals, there's definitely injustices for sure. There's systemic um, injustices, systemic racism and systemic, um, I mean, oh my God, absolutely. So that's like, Exposing that and being aware of that, I think, is so important and knowing that. And then I also think more on the solution side is what you're talking about. Really, truly 
explicitly talking about our resilience and our oneness and seeing that and feeling that. Because if you're really feeling that and seeing that, why would you want to hurt somebody? Let me let me step in right there for a second. And um, just ask, the like, we talked to, just, we all know what we mean by inside out, outside in. Um, would you would you go into a little bit about what you mean by the inside out versus outside in, in nature of life? Go ahead, Jason. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> you know, I just put a new page on my website and it's and the title is already knowing, right? And so it's being in the unknown. So if I speak from what I know, how could I learn from that? And you are our guest. So if you want me to go there, I can, but I would really love to hear what you have to say. Okay. Are you, are you right. up for that? Sure. Okay. So, um, I'm going to try to make this as cleanly, as clean, as clear and clean as possible. So inside out understanding is saying that we experience, how we experience the world is from, is an internal experience and it's happening, happening from thought in the moment, the thoughts that are passing through us in the moment. So whatever those thoughts look like, some of them we're really aware of, some of them we're not aware of, they can be, oh my God all types of thinking that we can't control, we can participate in, but we can't control. But it's to me, it's like the visual is like thought is passing through. And as it passes through, we feel whatever the heck is going on, we feel, and it's brought to life through our senses by awareness. So if I'm thinking about my mom, you know, I, I can see her, I start to get sad because my mom has dementia. So I can like start to like feel sad because I'm thinking about her in the nursing home right now. And so I can feel that thinking that's happening. I'm not going to be thinking about now. I'm like going back into, you know, talking to you guys and I'm not thinking about her anymore. So my feelings are changing. So that's this inside out, which is how we experience everything. And outside in is, is um, I guess a belief that the external world or circumstances can make us feel a certain way. Like they have the power to make us feel a certain way. And I always wanna say, but, because I know what I heard and what I think a lot of people hear is, well, you know, if someone's being really, um, does that mean you just have to be a doormat and put up with people's bad behavior and, and you know, when they're treating you like shit? No. And it's and it, absolutely not, right? And it doesn't mean that that person's behavior, um, in my words, is okay, or that I'm going to allow it. But it's not. It's it's the thinking of, that's going through me with that situation that's creating my feeling. And no matter what the circumstance is, my thinking, depending on what thinking is going through me at the time, is what's really creating my feeling, not the circumstance itself. And that allows so much more understanding of what the heck, where our feelings are coming from. And that understanding can really allow us, or it allows me to participate a little bit more. First of all, I have a sense of relief, knowing what the, you know that I know where my feelings are coming from. It's like, oh, okay, I, I, I see how it works. And then number two, there's an element of participation. So, you know, if, um, if the thinking that, you know, it, I, like we can't control our thinking, it's coming in and it's happening 24 seven until the day we die. But in my words, there's a little bit of participation. So if I'm thinking about something or if I'm looped in something that is, it's, it, that I don't want to be looped into, there's a certain amount of participation that I can have in that I might say, you know what? I don't want to think about this right now. Number one. Number two, if I if I can't, I can also at least understand what's going on. I am like in this shitty feel right now. I know where it's coming from. And for me, there's a little bit more, there's quite a bit more distance between that personal narration and that story. I know that beyond that um, narration also is like the real me that can't be touched, that can't be talking about resilience and creativity that can't be hurt. I might feel hurt, but beyond those feelings is the juice, the cool stuff. 
that we all have no matter what. Yeah. I love, I love that you did a, a good job as anybody. <laughs> Thanks. Like, I mean, how do you explain how reality works? Right. I mean, but what you're saying to me is kind of sort of when we start talking about the social justice conversation and what's going on, like, yes, like something happens in the world, say, Dave Chappelle puts out a comedy special <laughs> called 846, I believe that's what it's called. Um, and that upset some people and other people made it really happy and other people it didn't affect at all and that's because each person on the inside like what they thought about what dave chappelle put out that affected them differently so dave chappelle didn't change his words for me to hear it for you to hear it for jason to hear it but what ends up happening is because of what i have boiling up or not inside of me like that's what i see in what they say so if I'm out, you know, um, yeah, that's, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And your, and your experience of, let's say you're watching, watching that your experience of that can be, and probably will be different at different times, depending on what's going on in your mind. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, that I, I really like that example. I think I think there's the individual experience, right? You know, I'm I'm likely to have uh, an experience of it, uh, you know, in some form. But that form also shifts, right? Like uh, JJ, you were saying about how, depending on if I got sleep that day, or depending on my my ride home from work, and and you know, I was so irritated because somebody did this or that, and now I'm watching this, and like it's the relief I needed or whatever. Just seeing that. Not only is it different for each person based on how they grew up and the experiences that they've had and what they believe to be true, but it's also different for us on a Tuesday, you know, like how, yeah. how random is that? Yeah. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, and the piece that I love too is like, um, we don't have to police our thoughts, you know, Yo. and the whole police, the whole you know, we, we know what kind of quality, if you want to give it a quality of thinking that we have, depending on how we feel. So if I'm feeling, in, and also what was so helpful for me is if I'm feeling in a low mood, I know that I'm, that my thoughts are just low and it doesn't mean anything about me. Number one, number two, it's going to change. Like I will get new thinking in at some point. And, and it, and so for me, it's like, whenever that happens, it's not really up to me anyway, but I will get new thinking and new solutions and new creativity and new ideas, particularly if I know that there it's hap you know, it, it's how the system works. Mm, so I love the opportunity with this stuff to always like in any moment, see what's going on in my, my life right now and to be able to use that. Right. Cause I see it. So today, um, son woke up. This is the thing in my house, right? Mm -hmm. Kids waking up early. Um, woke up at 11 o'clock last night. Not a big deal. Like I literally have twins. So one hand's on each one of their beds because they like across from each other. Wife was watching on the uh, like the monitor. <laughs> She's like, you looked almost like you were in a zen position there. Like I should have <laughs> took a picture or something. <laughs> so I was like, She's like, you were in there for 45 minutes. I said, what? I guess I, I don't know, anyway, so son wakes up 5 a.m. I'm, I'm up anyway. So I'm like, all right, let's go lay on the couch together. He sleeps till six. So I'm like, you want to go find your mom now? Cause I'm like, I don't know what else to do with you. Mm -hmm. um, so he's tired essentially. And it's 7, 45, eight o'clock here. Mm -hmm. And I know we have something to do at nine o'clock. And I'm like, Hey, I probably should get my yoga in before. And so he starts going off like just he's tired and before i would look at that and be like what's wrong with that kid he knows i got things to do because of this i'm like mm, he's tired he needs to chill 
I go outside, I do my yoga in a different spot than I've ever done it before. And so many things came to me fresh and new in my yoga session today that mm-hmm. normally don't. Like, so I get up off the mat and I'm in a different space, a completely different space. And when I walk back in the house, he's still crying. Like, wife's like, he had been doing that the whole time. <laughs> <I'm> like, <"What?" laughs> but I walk back in and I'm just like in a different space. So his crying means a different thing to me. Like her, like I see her stressed a little bit about him crying. Like that, that's cool. My daughter is just like, la, 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 la. so, I mean, that's something to be thankful for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, it's, it, you're so right. Every time we look at this from the, like when we know where our experience of life is coming from. And again, if any of you are like, Hey, this is some crazy talk. All three of us are coaches. So like, if you would like to sit down with one of us and say, what were you talking about? Yeah. Don't be afraid to hit us all up. We will link that later in the bio and all that other stuff. Um, but more specifically, when we understand how life works, like thinking comes, it goes. I go outside, I do yoga. I come back inside. The world looked different. Yeah. And everything's the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. I just, especially that last line that you said, the world looked different, but everything's the same. It's like, how cool is that? That we can have inside, like depending on what's going on inside, like our like world glasses change, you know? Yeah. I was thinking earlier, as you were describing the inside out nature is like, you know, hitting up golden corral, you know, you don't really have a choice of what's out there right? The chicken's there, whatever's there is there, but you get to choose what you pay attention to, right? And, and it's that, that we create our indigestion later, or we don't, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we don't control what thoughts come into our head. It's just like, damn, why am I thinking that? I mean, wow, what a jerk I am for having that thought. But we didn't create the thought, but we don't have to pay attention to it. We don't have to pick it up. We don't have to do anything with it. If we see that it's not helpful, this is not a food that really sits right with me, then I'm not going to mess with it. And and that is the experience. That's how we can create our experience of life. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. yeah. That participatory experience. Yeah. That's so cool. That. Ah, so <laughs> that was awesome. Oh, <laughs> but um, seriously, in regards, and I'm just going to bring it back to the social justice yeah. issue for a second. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I think it's important to state again, and maybe we could fly off a little bit on this a little bit. But if we do this right as a society this time, the United States could be the beacon of what it's like to bring everybody and say, hey, look, we are one country. Here we are. Boom. And we could, again, be world leaders. And I mean, that's not what it's about is, hey, let's be world leaders. But um, yeah, what are y'all what are y'all's thoughts on that before we get out of here? I think it's super exciting. I mean, I. um, I think. I think that right now that could be a huge catalyst moment for so much change on a on a personal level and like a community level and a global level. And like could potentially, like I love, I love the idea. And I, and I think that I can't even fathom what positive change could happen with the inside out understanding, honestly, because if people are coming from, if they're come from is of, of love and understanding, the whole world is going to look different. I think it's, I, oh my God, like, it's exciting to me. I want to be part of it. You know, um, I think everybody recognizes and already knows this anyway. So to talk about this would literally be part, I feel like we're in this like waking up moment anyway, I hope. And I think so. And I think people, when they feel, when they understand themselves better, they're going to be nicer. They're going to be, you know, they're going to, they're going to be more productive. They're going to want, want to be more collaborative. They're going to be more creative. And I think that ripple effect could be enormous. Uh, this just came to mind, but this is kind of like 
quitting smoking cigarettes or anything really. And what I mean is like, so 200 years ago, let's say we were like, Hey, we don't want slavery anymore. That's not when that happened, but right. Yeah. And so every time we have this discussion, Martin Luther King was one of those times we move a little closer to the goal. Mm -hmm. And then like, we think we, we think we're so far removed from it, but all of the things that we did to get to that point are very still valuable as we move forward. And it looks to me like here's another one of those chance, those opportunities where we're like, Hey, it's time to quit. Not cold Turkey either, but we're going to, we yeah. need to quit. And, yeah. um, that's what I love about this conversation is because the more each and every one of us and everybody that out there that, that listens to this, we go out there and we're having these conversations with our friends, having these conversations with our loved ones. And what I mean is that that racist joke that was at the water cooler before instead you say something versus having that that uh, whatever race that person was. So whether it's a Mexican joke or a black joke or a gay joke, instead of being like, oh, yeah, man, that's funny. Or maybe not even laughing. I know, I know we've had that conversation. Sometimes you just don't laugh at all. Yeah. Maybe now's the time to yeah. say something. Yeah. I think that would be incredibly powerful. And again, like if you're, if you're feeling secure in yourself, you're not going to laugh at somebody else's expense. I don't think. Yeah. Well, that's very true. That's very yeah. You know, it's coming to mind what, uh, based on both what, what you both said is it's, it's about the upstream, right? Like we can solve the, okay, yep. I need to talk to Joe about what he said at the water cooler. I need to do this with my dad. He always says this type of stuff, right? We got to go fix a million things, right? But if we take it upstream and I'm thinking of it like with health, okay, I need to quit smoking. I probably should run. I need to fix my food because I'm really eating like crap. Like there's a lot of things to fix. But if we go upstream and look at it from a health level and have a different understanding about health, all those things are affected, right? It's like downstream, it's like pollution. You know, if we stop dumping the pollution upstream, everything downstream is now positively affected. So I I mean, for me, at least with social justice, that's what it, I mean, it sounds like that's the conversation that we're having right here, right? If people can look at themselves and change themselves, everything shifts, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yep, yep, I love that, yep. Yes. Yeah. Wow. This is this has been a great conversation. Thank y'all both for all your input. Jason, it feels like you've seen things fresh and new since the last time we talked last week. And JJ, like to know the, that we have people in the school system just like yourself going out there and really trying to do what's best for those students, like that's all we can ask for. So I want to personally thank you. And I'm sure there's people out there that want to thank you as well. Thank you. That's so nice. It's been lovely to talk to you guys. Yeah. Thanks Good for to inviting get to me. Know you. Yeah. And, and I think I, I just want to say too, like that is the power of, of people just having conversations with other people, right? Mm -hmm. Like anything new that I'm seeing today is, a, is part of the recipe, right? You guys joined the conversation. I joined the conversation. We're all putting things in and now we get to see fresh new things. And really yep. that's what we offer with people with coaching. It's like, yep. let's show up, let's just compare notes on what it looks like to us. And we're both gonna see fresh and new. And like, that's how lives shift. I mean, it's been, I, I it's just since January when we joined the program and, and really what we've been learning, like it's crazy to see how life can be so, I wanna say better, but just so much cleaner almost, yeah. less pollution. I love that. That's so cool. Yay. Let's stay in conversation. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot. See you guys.